Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, President of the Republic of South Africa, uh, Deputy President, Cabinet colleagues, uh, Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, uh, Honorable Members, Members of the Executive Committees for Finance, Honorable Members once again. It is my singular honor and privilege to present the 2021 budget. Today I table before this house the following. One, the appropriation bill. Two, the special appropriation bill. Three, the division of revenue bill. Four, the budget review. And fifthly, the estimates of national expenditure. Madam Speaker, last year we outlined the strategy to becoming a winning country. Since then, we have mourned the passing of nearly 50,000 of our fellow South Africans as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The damage visited upon us by COVID-19 runs deep and we share in the collective pain of many South Africans who have lost their jobs. All of this notwithstanding, Madam Speaker, we are not without hope. Our national icon, the Nobel laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu, reminded us that, and I quote, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness, unquote. He observed that sometimes we forget that just beyond the clouds, the sun is shining. The brave and fearless sacrifices of our frontline workers continue to save thousands of lives. We salute all our health care and essential service workers who remain standing at the front line of our struggle against COVID-19. We also salute the many South Africans who rallied to help others to survive. I must include amongst the frontline workers that we normally forget, these are the military medical services. These acts of human solidarity and sacrifice reflect a patriotic spirit that runs in our veins and inspires us. The president would have said, this is in our DNA. Well, it's much better English, I suppose. Often we speak about how we must leave this earth much better than what we found so that the future generations can enjoy a better world. Today I want to leave all of us hopeful and outline how we will leave this economy in a better shape for those who come after us. Under the leadership of our president, we have crafted a fiscal framework that extends support to the economy and public health services in the short term, while ensuring the sustainability of our public finances in the medium term. This is our first reason for hope. The fiscal framework we table today entails the following. The main budget revenue is projected to be 1.35 trillion rand, or 25.3% as a share of gross domestic product in 2021. This rises to 1.52 trillion rand in the outer year, the outer year being 2023-24 of the medium term expenditure framework. When we were writing these numbers, Mr. President, 1.52 trillion, I was tempted to ask one member of the House how many zeros are in a trillion, but I 
thought not to do that. <clears throat> At the same time, non-interest spending will remain steady at approximately 1.56 trillion rands over the next three years, but will decline as a share of GDP from 29.2% in 2021-22 to 26.2% of GDP in 23-24. I requested tips from the public to help in crafting this budget. Many tips spoke about the limits to increased taxation. Others spoke about the need to cut the number of cabinet ministers, and I told them that was above my pay cut. It's above my pay level. That's not, that's not mine. We agree that tax increases must be kept to a minimum. And therefore, General Preval, there's no need for a tax revolt. We have chosen not to introduce the 40 billion rand in tax measures initially proposed in the October medium term budget policy statement. I'll explain why later. With this framework, we provide the budget for South Africa's vaccination campaign. This campaign allows us to emerge from the restrictions that we have experienced to economic activity. So the restrictions were meant to help us fight against COVID. And now, as we gradually fight this introducing vaccines, we should be able to return in time to full economic activity. We are allocating more than 10 billion rand for the purchase and delivery of vaccines over the next two years. <clears throat> but we do not stop there. We are increasing the contingency reserve from 5 billion to 12 billion to make provision for any further purchases of vaccines and to cater for any other emergencies. With this framework, we are on track to achieve our goal of closing the main budget primary deficits. We shall achieve a primary surplus on the main budget in 2024-25. This will be an important achievement and will coincide with the end of this sixth parliament. Most importantly, we will stabilize government debt at 88.9% of GDP in 2025-26. And the ratio will decline further thereafter. This is a significant commitment and improvement to the framework as compared to what we presented in October last year and creates a sound platform for sustainable growth. I thought you would clear because it says this is a significant improvement to the framework that we presented in October last year and creates a sound platform for sustainable growth. Total consolidated spending amounts to two trillion rand each year over the medium term, the majority of which goes to social services, about 56%. So when people talk about austerity this, austerity that, you can't. It's, 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 it's not supported by empirical evidence. Uh, <clears throat> Honorable members, getting our fiscal house in order is the biggest contribution we can make to support our economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Continuing on the path of fiscal consolidation during these economic times was a difficult decision. But we're here precisely because we want to make difficult decisions. If you want to make easy decisions, go swimming. <laughs> However, on this we are resolute. 
will remain adamant that fiscal prudence is the best way forward. We cannot allow our economy to have feet of clay. High government debt levels increase the cost of borrowing across the economy. The rising debt levels lead to higher future taxation and uncertainty. Servicing this rising debt takes away resources that could have been invested in infrastructure and frays our social solidarity. Madam Speaker, yes, sometimes he's the deputy speaker. <laughs> it reminds me when the Honorable Sisulu was the, the speaker and after Honorable uh, Freni Jingwal and somebody referred to Honorable Sisulu as Madam Speaker. <clears throat> So, Madam Speaker, my second reason for hope stems from our much improved economic outlook. Global economic growth is expected to rebound to 5.5% in 2021, before moderating slightly to 4.2% in 2022, spared on by the expected rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines throughout the world and other additional policy measures, deliberate economic policy measures. China is expected to grow at 8.1% in 2021, while India will achieve a growth rate of 11.5% in 2021. Sub-Saharan Africa is forecast to grow by 3.2%. In this context, Mr. President, the South African economy is expected to rebound by 3.3% this year, following a 7.2% contraction in 2020, an average around 1.9% in the outer two years. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I am also hopeful because we are making meaningful progress in the implementation of our structural reform program. Our structural weaknesses limit the rate at which our economy can grow. Our structural reform agenda, as articulated in the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan, is aimed at removing these breaks on economic growth. Operation Volindlel, which I introduced to you last year, has already made demonstrable progress in accelerating the pace of implementation of high impact structural reforms. More often than not, we are very hard on ourselves and we say we make decisions that we never implement. This is not the case here. We are implementing. Much of this progress was outlined in the State of the Nation Address by our President. I want to thank my cabinet colleagues for their support of Operation and I assure members that Deputy Minister Dr. David Masondo and the team from the Presidency and the National Treasury remain hard at work together with the relevant departments to ensure the continued implementation of the remaining reforms as outlined. We will not rest until we have fundamentally altered the structure of this economy by lowering barriers to entry, broadening ownership patterns, which some people don't want to talk about, raising productivity, and lowering the cost of doing business. Honorable members, we face many challenges as a developing country. We are confronting these challenges head on. Our country has a network of highways and byways, which are the envy of many around the world. The mighty N1 that starts just here in Cape Town to Bite Bridge, the scenic R71 that meanders through the misty mountains of Mahobasluf and delivers us to the Kruger National Park, and the expansive N4 that stretches from Botswana across our country into Mozambique. They are part of the lifeblood of the regional economy. Our great dams, bridges, and railway lines 
They have supported our economy for decades. However, much of this infrastructure now needs to be repaired. Government is committed, is committed to a 791.2 billion rand in infrastructure investment. We are already partnering. We are already partnering with the private sector and other players to roll out infrastructure through initiative such as the blended finance system. However, all these efforts to expand infrastructure will be wasted if the end user does not pay a cost reflective tariff for usage. Let me repeat. However, all these efforts to expand infrastructure will be wasted if the end user does not pay a cost effective tariff for use. Therefore, the principle of the user pays is very important. And I would like to repeat it in this house. The other thing, Honorable President, the other thing is a tendency amongst us, or some amongst us, to destroy infrastructure. We build today, somebody burns tomorrow. We build a police station, they burn it, tomorrow they demonstrate that they need a police station. Doesn't make sense. And therefore, we cannot do this anymore. We have to confront head on the culture of the destruction of our own infrastructure and introduce a new mentality of asset management. The communities must own these assets and protect and defend them. Madam Speaker, my fourth reason for hope is that this budget explicitly supports economic transformation and job creation. Our 6.2 trillion spending envelope over the medium term expenditure framework gives expression to the economic reconstruction and recovery program. Now, this, once again, I must say, is not an austerity budget. Uh, and I must emphasize this, particularly for those in the democratic movement. This is not an austerity budget. This is not an austerity budget. An austerity budget, as explained by one honorable member here, would be a situation where we're now closing social grants, we're now closing schools, we are now no longer spending on anything, that we cut old age pension and everything else, like you saw in Greece. That's austerity. This one, icon. <laughs> our fastest growing area of spending is our investment in the future capital payments progress. Now, the Minister of the Department of Public Service and Administration Minister Sales of Mkunu, is working with our partners in organized labor to achieve a fair public sector compensation dispensation when negotiations resume on a new multi-year wage settlement later this year. I know that some who, when they're aware, not aware that conversations are taking place, they say that we are lying when we say conversations are taking place. When you're not aware, it doesn't mean it's not happening. We have cumulatively made 83.2 billion available for the public employment program since the 2020 special adjustment budget. We are now augmenting this by 11 billion rand for the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative, taking the total funding for employment creation to nearly 100 billion. When the president spoke about 100 billion, people said, people said the president was dreaming, but it's a good dream uh, because it's being realized now. The key issue, just proceed and get the wheels going. Government plans to finalize a, a 1,409 restitution claim, claims at a cost of 9.3 9 billion over the next three years to achieve redress and equitable access to land. 
Within this context, the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development will set aside 896.7 million for post-settlement support. This will include the recruitment of approximately 10,000 experienced extension officers. The reason why I say experienced, so you don't hire somebody immediately from, uh, from high school as a, an extension officer, because then they arrive at the, the Ramaphosa farm to help, but they expect him to teach them. <laughs> so it, it can't work like that. You have to know what is farming. So when you go to Minister Mandashi to advise him, don't expect him to advise you how to grow sheep. You should be able to advise him how to make good. So we emphasize the experience uh, in the extension workers. A total MTF allocation of 7 billion is being made available to the land bank. This allocation, this allocation will help to resolve the bank's current default and re-establish the development and transformation mandate. This amount will not affect the expenditure ceiling, but will be offset through other budgetary processes, as will be the case with all other state-owned enterprises. The Department of Small Business Development has allocated 4 billion rand over the medium term to support township and rural enterprises. In 21-22, government expects to collect 1.37 trillion, provided our underlying assumptions on the performance of the economy and the tax base hold. I would like to take this opportunity to thank those South Africans who diligently continue to pay their taxes, rendering unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In this budget, we make the following tax proposals. Mm. Number one. Maybe we should make that number last. Uh. Anyway, number one, the corporate income tax rate will be lowered to 27% for companies with years of assessment commencing on or after 1 April 2022. Now, <clears throat> now this needs to be explained. This will be done alongside a broadening of the corporate income tax base by limiting interest deductions and assessed losses will give consideration to further rate decreases to make our tax system more attractive and competitive. We will do so in a revenue neutral manner. We also intend to leverage the insights of the tax David Davis tax committee as we undertake this reform process. I think I'll have to come back to this to explain. Two, the personal income tax brackets will be increased by 5%, which is more than inflation general, Kronewald. Uh, this will provide 2.2 billion rand in tax relief. Most of that relief will reduce the tax burden on the lower and middle income households. As an illustration, if you are earning above the new tax-free threshold, of 87,300 rand, you will have at least an extra 756 rand in your pocket as of the 1st of March 2021. Three, fuel levels will be increased by 27 cents per liter, comprising 15 cents per liter for the general fuel levy and 11 cents per liter for the road accident fund levy and one cent per liter for the carbon fuel levy. This is important to, to emphasize because we're moving towards a carbon-free environment. And we have recently established the presidential um, 
Coordinating Committee on Climate Change. Fourthly, an 8% increase in excise duties on alcohol and tobacco products. <clears throat> from today, from today, with immediate effect, with immediate effect. A, a 340 milliliter can of beer or cider will cost an extra 14 cents. B, a 750 milliliter bottle of wine will cost an extra 26 cents with immediate effect. C, a 750 milliliter bottle of sparkling wine, an extra 86 cents. Next, a bottle of 750 milliliter spirits, including whiskey, gin or vodka, will increase by five rand fifty cents. Next, next, a packet of twenty cigarettes will be an extra one rand thirty nine cents. Next, twenty five grams of piped tobacco will cost an extra forty seven. Sense. I'm sorry, uh, one retired president, I'm sorry. Um, and a 23 gram cigar will be 7 rand 71 more expensive. <clears throat> there is no, there is no increase in the, in the price of traditional beer. We have to do this partly in honor of some of the more elderly members of the house. In fact, ever since when Trevor Manuel was Minister of Finance, uh, this is it's one thing which has stayed constant. It is clear that the excessive alcohol consumption in our country can lead to negative social and health outcomes. Consumers do react to price increases, and higher prices should lead to lower consumption of alcohol products with positive spin-offs. SARS has started to deepen its technology, data, and machine learning capability. I won't ask what is machine learning. It is also expanding specialized audit and investigative skills in the tax and customs areas to renew its focus on the abuse of transfer pricing, tax base erosion, and tax crime. In this coming fiscal year, SARS will establish a dedicated unit to improve compliance of individuals with wealth and complex financial arrangements. This first group of taxpayers have already been identified and will receive communication during April 2021. In support of these initiatives, we request that this House approve an additional spending allocation to SARS of 3 billion rand over the medium term. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> let me now turn to the Division of Revenue. The 2021-22 Division of Revenue stands as follows. 48.7% of nationally raised funds are allocated to national government, 41.9% to provinces, and 9.4% to local government. This is after providing for debt service costs, the contingency reserve, and provisional allocations that I made mention of earlier. The provincial equitable share will be augmented by 8 billion rand 
for provincial health departments in 2021-22 to deal with COVID-19. Of the 10.3 billion for vaccines, 2.4 billion is allocated to the provincial departments of health to administer the COVID-19 pro vaccine program. Government will also put in place a no-fault compensation fund to cover claims in the unlikely event of any severe vaccine injuries, allocations to which will be announced in due course. The local government equitable share is set to increase to 9.7% of the Division of Revenue in 23-24. We are aware that financial governance remains a challenge for many municipalities. Therefore, the Municipal Systems Improvement Grant is extended for the rollout of the district development model. Madam Speaker, we hereby wish to encourage collaboration and partnerships between municipal councils, labor, communities, and the private sector around the principles of shared risk and shared reward. There needs to be a transition to smart local government and innovation. At the same time, well-functioning municipalities require that residents pay for services rendered. Provinces will receive 3.5 billion from the Department of Social Development to improve access to early childhood development services. 6.3 billion is allocated to extend the special COVID social relief of distress grant until the end of April 2021. Mr. President, we're responding to your injunction. In addition, 678.3 million is earmarked for provincial department of social development and basic, basic education to continue rolling out free sanitary towels for learners from low income households. Now, the regular social assistance grants are adjusted upwards. The Old Age Disability Care Dependency Grants are increased to 1,890 rands. The increase for War Veterans Grant to 1,910 rand. An increase in Child Support Grant goes up to 460 rand. An increase for Foster Care Grant increases to 1,050 rand. Government remains committed to ensuring that deserving students are supported through higher education. The National Treasury is working closely with the Department of Higher Education and Training to work out on policy and funding options that will be detailed in the medium term budget policy statement. What this means is that deserving students who have been admitted to university will be supported. <clears throat> The budget that we table here today, Madam Speaker, takes seriously our commitment to the continent of which we are part. Payments to the Southern African Customs Union, SACU, have been revised upwards by 1.9 billion in 2022 and 15.5 billion in 2023-24 to 137 rand 137.3 billion rand over the medium term. This, this is very important for some of the countries in Southern Africa, and we must not lose sight of the need to adjust this. <clears throat> the African Re Renaissance and International Cooperation Fund will, over the medium term, support pro various projects in Africa, whether it's democracy, economic development, integration, and others. An allocation of 148.1 million rand is therefore set aside for this fund. 
The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, part of which came into effect early this year, presents us with the opportunity to deepen our trade and financial linkages with our continent. Following last year's budget announcement on supporting the African Continental Free Trade Agreement through a more modern risk-based capital management flow system, much progress has been made to implement the new system and new regulations will be published by the South African Reserve Bank shortly. The National Treasury also continues to work with industry bodies to promote South Africa as a financial hub for Africa. From the 1st of March 2021, companies with a primary listing offshore, including dual listings, will be aligned to current foreign direct investment rules, which the South African Reserve Bank oversees. In order to improve access to African markets, our six busiest border posts will be upgraded and expanded. This will significantly improve our infrastructure investments using the PPP model. Public-private partnerships. Starting with Bite Bridge, <clears throat> which was built in 1929 and was last upgraded in 1995. These one-stop border posts will harmonize the crossing of, border, of borders by people and goods, eliminating the dreadful sins that we have witnessed recently. But I need to emphasize the public-private partnership model. <clears throat> Though we face many difficulties, we must not lose sight of our place in the world, as well as our potential and responsibilities. 25 years ago, on the 8th of May, 1996, on the occasion of the adoption of the South African Constitution, former President Tabon Beke delivered his seminal I mean, African address from this podium. President Beke reminded us that there are moments in time when we must define what we want to be. And I quote, together with the best in the world, we too are prone to pettiness petulance, selfishness, and short-sightedness. But it seems to have happened that we looked at ourselves and said the time had come that we make a superhuman effort to be other than human, to respond to the call to create for ourselves a glorious future, to remind ourselves of the Latin saying, Gloria, est consequenda. Glory must be sought. Honorable members, our fiscal path requires that we better leverage government status as the largest purchaser of goods and services in the country. Finalization of the procurement bill is therefore urgent. The National Treasury is fast-tracking the process of this bill. This bill addresses fragmentation in the procurement legislation. We aim to table this reform before cabinet as soon as possible. Many of the tips that I received spoke of the importance of zero-based budgeting. The National Treasury is finalizing the framework to implement zero-based budgeting across the government system. This will be done through spending reviews, which have been used internationally to achieve spending efficiencies. These reviews are already underway and will shape this framework. <clears throat> the Department of Public Enterprises and the National Treasury will be the first to pilot a new budgeting methodology. The intention is to produce significantly re-costed budgets from 22 to 23. 
The Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, Madam Speaker, is allocated a further 1.8 billion to improve business processes. This allocation will support our brave law enforcement agents in the fight against crime and corruption. We are bringing the long arm of the law into the digital age through the Justice Modernization Program. The South African Revenue Service, South African Reserve Bank, and the Financial Intelligence Center are working jointly on combating criminal and illicit cross-border activities through an interagency working group. This group has completed 117 investigations and found 2.7 billion rand for our fiscus. In other words, they've recovered. Customs and excise operations are reducing the illicit movement of goods across borders, assisted by specialized cargo scanners, resulting in 3,393 seizures valued at 1.5 billion for the fiscal year to January. We announced in the medium term budget policy statement the historic agreement with all NEDLEC constituencies for the annuitization of provident funds. This will enable all workers to continue to enjoy tax deductions on their contributions. The NEDLEC constituencies also agreed to accelerate the introduction of auto enrollment for all employed workers and the establishment of a fund to cater for workers currently excluded from pension coverage as an urgent intervention towards a comprehensive social security system. I can announce once again that annuitization for provident funds takes effect from the 1st of March 2021. And provident fund members will continue to enjoy a tax deduction on their contribution. In addition, as we mentioned before, the National Treasury will this week publish draft amendments to the Regulation 28 for public comment. The proposed amendments to Regulation 28, in case somebody misunderstands, is to make it easier for retirement funds to increase their investments in infrastructure. This 2021 budget framework puts South Africa on a course to achieve a primary surplus. By doing this, government debt will stabilize at 88.9% of GDP in 2025. The path is challenging but achievable. It is the most prudent way to achieve higher levels of prosperity and, so, and avoid a sovereign debt crisis. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, when the Constitution was adopted 25 years ago, the words quote, nothing can stop us now, unquote, resonated in this house. As we affirm our commitment to sustainable public finances, we also at the same time affirm the supremacy of the Constitution. And that all of us, young and old, must abide by the injunctions in the Constitution. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank the President of the Republic of South Africa and the Deputy President for their courageous leadership during these testing times. A word of appreciation to the Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. David Masondo. Thanks to the Director General of the National Treasury, the hard-working Dondo Mohajan and his dedicated team at the National Treasury. Many thanks to the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Service who continues to collect revenue and help us, the hard-working Mr. Edward Kiswet. <laughs> and he's also good-mannered, by the way. My gratitude as well go to the Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Lisecha Khanyako, and the outstanding staff at the South African Reserve Bank for their support. We normally do modeling together and we 
you know, it's wonderful. I particularly want to appreciate my colleagues in cabinet and the wisdom of the minister's committee on the budget, MinCombat. I also thank my colleagues in the budget council, which budget council is uh, Minister of Finance together with the MECs of Finance. Uh, I know there's one of them doesn't like to be called an MEC, but it's fine. I am grateful to the parliamentary committees who also work tirelessly, tirelessly on the budget processing uh, through all this documentation in order to provide Parliament with a report. Finally, to the millions of South Africans who face and continue to face enormous difficulties and challenges. We ask of you to take courage, persevere, and work with us. Above all, let us heed the counsel of Archbishop Desmond Tutu to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. A prosperous future is possible for our beloved country. Gloria est consequen. I thank you very much. <clears throat> So that's uh, Tito Mboweni, the South African Finance Minister, presenting uh, his national budget to Parliament today. I took one big surprise, and that was on a corporate tax cut uh, to 27% from 2022. The minister, some of the minister's figures as well, a little bit on the uh, better than expected side. So I just wanted to run through the main highlights that we have uh, uh, seen coming out of uh, that budget. So the deficit sitting at 14% of our GDP. This is for this uh, financial year. Uh, this is, of course, as the government spends more to try to combat uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there is a bill there that was estimated before it about 20 billion rand that would not have been in the uh, books. Uh, then also there's the issue of course of uh, uh, the collection of taxes which would have been impacted by the slower growth. Uh, we're going to be going through that detail later. Gross debt uh, has uh, increased as a percentage of GD GDP has uh, increased from 65.6% to 80.3%. Uh, uh, this is uh, in this uh, fiscal year. And then uh, to try to narrow the deficit, uh, the minister uh, is uh, talking about uh, uh, trying to narrow it uh, from the primary deficit of 7.5% of GDP in the current year to 0.8. This is the primary, primary deficit. Um, the minister also speaks about uh, the government uh, not rolling out uh, a free mass COVID-19 vaccination campaign for which uh, he allocated 9 billion rand. Uh, so the government, sorry, I read that again. The government is rolling out a free mass COVID-19 uh, vaccination campaign. So the cost has come from about 20 billion rand to 9 billion rand. That seems interesting. Okay. Then he says over the medium term, debt service as uh, as uh, de debt service costs are expected to average 20.9% uh, of uh, gross tax uh, revenue. We'll be going through the details of that budget, which has just been presented as you saw to Parliament here in South in South Africa in Cape Town uh, after this break. <laughs>